So good morning everyone and welcome to today's Wellness Wise webinar on building a mentally healthy workplace. My name is Katrina Walton and I'm founder and director of Wellness Designs, a boutique workplace wellness consultancy and we help Australian organisations to create healthy, safe and high performing workplaces. Uh, it's great to see such a range of attendees again today across Australasia and also as far as New York and once more across a range of industries including the likes of consultants, health and aged care, um, transport, utilities, IT, financial services, universities, just to name a few. We're very much uh, looking forward to today's session and I think as the turnout today has shown, it's mental health is certainly uh, an area of growing concern within workplaces and also potentially a very costly one to organisations. And certainly what we see in discussions with our clients is that it's certainly an area that they're still grappling with in how to create a mentally healthy workplace and one that really moves beyond you know your mental health month or your are you okay day which are certainly very good at you know raising that awareness within workplaces but it's looking more to how can we continue that conversation across the entire year and ideally develop a strategic framework on how to best approach and support employee mental health and well-being so before we get going, I just wanted to touch on a few housekeeping items. If you haven't already, an opportunity to check your audio settings to ensure you get the most out of the webinar. And you'll also have the opportunity to submit que written questions throughout the webinar, of which we will respond to at the end. Also, if you need to communicate with us throughout the webinar, just drop us a note via the chat function. For those that are, are Twitters uh, or tweet, like to tweet, uh, if you just, our hash is, hashtag is wellness wise. And finally, what we'll be doing at the end of the webinar is you'll be sent an evaluation link to a survey, a very brief one, where we would just love your feedback as to how you found today's session, but also importantly, any topics that you would like to see included in this Wellness Wise webinar series into the future. So without further ado, I have the great pleasure of introducing you now to our facilitator for today's session, uh, the wonderful Rachel Clements, who is co-founder and director for the Centre for Corporate Health and also Resilient. And Centre for Corporate Health is also a strategic partner with Are You OK Day as well. And Rachel holds a bachelor's degree in uh, with honours in psychology and also a master's degree in organisational psychology. So welcome Rachel. Good morning everyone, thank you for having me here to come and talk to you about this very important topic about uh, effectively building a mentally healthy workplace. I have worked a lot in this space, particularly since this area of mental health in the workplace has got a lot of momentum over the last few years. And probably what I see as one of the biggest trends is, is sadly our prevalence rates of mental health in our workplace population is on the increase. So I will share some statistics and some prevalence rates with you in a moment. And what I do see is that organisations, there's a lot of organisations doing some very good proactive work in this space, um, which is really making a difference. I see from, from my experience, what I see is that organisations are very much more aware of mental health in the workplace, the need to be good at doing something proactive and preventative and having mental health on the corporate radar, which, which is a big shift. And you know, even probably eight years ago, we wouldn't have been even having a session like this. It, it wouldn't have even really been a feature on the corporate radar. So it's great to see that it is now. And there's a few reasons as, as to why that is the, why, why that is the case. And, and firstly, one of them is the prevalence rates have, have increased in the last few years of mental health in the workplace. And as a result, the economics and the business cost is quite significant in that regard. The gap I see in this space is whilst organisations have been very good at awareness raising with days like Are You OK Day or Mental Health Month, the gap that I see for organisations and the biggest challenge in this space is how do organisations develop an integrated approach, an integrated model for mental health in the workplace so we can build mentally healthy workplaces and it's not just a one day event, but it is something that is sustainable over time and it's on the radar uh, every day uh, throughout the year. 
So today I'm going to talk to you about a couple of those elements is how do we have that more integrated approach and what does that look like. In terms of just showing, sharing with you some of the, um, the, the information on um, some of the statistics and, and the prevalence rates in this space, I think the good thing now is, as I said before, the awareness raising piece has, has now been done. We're all aware that this is a significant issue. But in the last couple of years, economics has really helped in this regard in that now we are able to put some business economics around mental health in the workplace. And I know for some of you getting this across the line in terms of uh, stakeholder engagement within businesses to be able to build mentally healthy workplaces and to develop good mental health initiatives, it does help it if we can speak to the financial cost and the financial impact. Um, and you know, it, it is predicted even that by the year 2020 that mental health issues and mental illness will be the leading cause of disease worldwide. So, you know, sadly, that's a trend to, to what we're heading towards. But now, I mean, this is just a couple of figures here in terms of, you know, Australian mental health is costing Australian business, businesses you know, $10.9 billion a year. But uh, in a recent report put out um, in, by uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers in the last couple of years, they were able to state that for every dollar that we invest in mental health initiatives, we actually get a good return on investment of, of $2.30. So if anyone's interested or, or challenged in relation to how do I make, how do I get some stakeholder buy-in and you want some good financial information, the report done by PricewaterhouseCoopers has been designed for that purpose. And um, if any of you uh, would like to know a bit more about that, I'm happy to email you this link after the session. But it was, was really designed to actually, probably the first report, it was only uh, launched and, and promoted a couple of years ago in relation to putting some figures around the cost of mental health in the workplace. So it's good to know that for every initiative you do do, in your workplaces, whether it might be something for Are You OK Day, whether it might be something around having an employee assistance program, it actually is a significant financial payoff and benefit to, to do so. Uh, so that's the, certainly the good news. In terms of other statistics and other prevalence uh, rates, we can see there's a lot out there in terms of the, the statistics and the, and the prevalence rates here. But in our workplace population, I mean, you can see there that the figures are around, you know, one in four Australians will, will suffer from, from a mental health issue such as depression or anxiety are our most common ones that we would see in our workplace population. And those statistics reflect the trends that we see in our general population. So what we normally see in our workplace population is that the prevalence rates are actually higher than that. So uh, generally most workplaces are operating around one in three one in three employees at some stage in their career will experience a, a significant mental health issue. Uh, I'm not gonna go through, through all of those costs there, but you can certainly see that, um, that the financial impact of having uh, people off work or struggling with a mental health issue uh, in silence without any intervention or assistance around them can be, can be very costly. The trend that we still see in our workplace population is that uh, we, we have high prevalence rates in our workplace population. So um, we, we see that you know, one in three employees perhaps will experience a significant mental health issue at some point in their career, but still quite low help seeking behavior. So still the majority of people who might be struggling with a mental health issue are reluctant to come forward and disclose that to their employer. So although organisations have been doing some wonderful preventative and promotional work and awareness raising work over the last few years, we still do see that there is a stigma. There it does still exist a stigma in relation to, to mental health in the workplace. Whilst that is reducing, we still see, see the prevalence, rate. we still see that, that that is impacting on people's behaviour. And there's certainly a couple of reasons why. Uh, firstly, we see that people are reluctant to come forward because they are concerned about the impact of that. So if I disclose that I'm struggling with a mental health issue, this might impact on my ability to you know, perform my job. Will it be career limiting for me? Will people overlook me for promotion? Am I going to be di given different quality work? Am I going to be treated differently about the around the workplace? So people still have a fear around the consequences of coming forward. So that psychological safety in many organisations is still quite low. Whilst we're building that, that will take some time 
I think, to, to change culture in that space. The second reason why people are reluctant to come forward is often due to the beliefs that they hold about themselves. So we call those those self-stigmatizing beliefs where people are concerned to come forward because they might think, um, you know, I might be, I'm, I'm embarrassed to come forward. I'm guilt, I feel guilty about it. I feel like I'm letting everybody down. Um, I feel like it might be a sign of weakness or I'm not coping. So people hold quite negative beliefs about themselves sometimes when they're struggling with a mental health issue. And the third reason that people are reluctant to come forward is that sometimes the very symptoms that somebody may be experiencing as a result of a mental health issue actually prevent them from reaching out for help and support. So if I am struggling with depression and my confidence is, is very low and I'm struggling with three to four hours sleep a night and I'm not feeling so great about myself, actually letting in my employer know that I'm struggling with a mental health issue actually takes a lot of confidence and it actually takes a lot of courage to actually come forward. So they're very much still the things that, that may be missing. So I think from that, and we, we certainly see those trends, I think stigma is reducing in this space, but still um, most of the referrals that we receive, we would receive a referral on a, on a daily basis from an organisation, usually an HR professional or a wellbeing professional, coming to us saying, we've got a staff member who's struggling with a mental health issue. Almost always, it's because HR or a manager or a colleague has picked up that somebody's not traveling so well and has initiated a conversation with that person. It is still hardly ever the person coming forward and putting up their hand saying, hey, I'm struggling, I need some help and support. So I am optimistic that over the next few years, we are going to see culture change in this space where we will be talking about mental health issues in the same breath that we will be talking about a physical health issue. Uh, but I know we're not quite there yet. There still exists that gap and there's still a little bit of work to do in our, in our organisations to creating that psychological safety culture where people can be safe to, to come to, to speak out and to speak openly. So for now, I think that the hat that we must wear in this space in terms of um, in a lot of the roles that you're in is being very much on the front foot, being proactive and getting good at initiating conversations. It's very different to a physical health issue perhaps where we might be responding. Someone's coming forward to us and we're responding to their concern and we're implementing something to mitigate risk. This is a very dif different space of mental health and, and traditionally I think some organisations tried to adopt processes and, and procedures that required a really good responsiveness. But um, the thing that they were finding is that hardly anyone was coming, coming forward so there wasn't much to respond to. So I think as long as we're all on the same page with, for the next little while, uh, whilst we're certainly doing a lot of work around culture change with respect to mental health in the workplace, it is about being on the front foot, being proactive and getting good at initiating conversations and getting good at initiating um, interventions in our workplace so it becomes part and parcel of our organisational culture. In terms of some of the industries, that we see that um, have fairly high prevalence rates of mental health issues. I've just put up some there, so you can certainly see some of the top organisations there or industries that, that have fairly high prevalence rates of mental health issues. And it depends, there's, there's a couple of studies on this one, um, which actually points to the prevalence rates. But as you can see there, um, you know, sales support, hospitality is very high, legal welfare type positions, health workers, uh, sales, insurance, um, clerks, um, accounting, um, actuarial, all those, all those types of occupations tend to be quite high. There was another study that was done by Beyond Blue in 2007, which actually focused on purely professional occupations. And as, as some of you may be aware, that hit the media very quickly in 2007 when it re revealed that lawyers were by far the most depressed uh, professional occupation there. So I'm, I'm just thinking in terms of if you're, if people are from some of those, those professions where mental health risks and, and prevalence rates are high, I always think, you know, we can no longer in those environments take our psychological wellbeing for granted. We actually have to be really good at doing something active and proactive uh, in that space. Um, we can't just rest in our laurels and assume that people are going to be okay 
um, when they're in roles, such as these ones that you can see there, where people are exposed to quite unique psychosocial risk factors on a regular basis. And it's often the exposure to those psychosocial risk factors um, over time uh, that can erode someone's ability to, to cope. So it just, it just means that organisations that are in those top 10 occupations um, need to be really good at having mental health on the corporate radar and, and using initiatives to build mentally healthy workplaces. In terms of why is mental health so important for us to, to focus on and to, to have in our workplaces, uh, there are four main reasons why. And, and certainly if you're looking to build business cases around mental health interventions in the workplace, these are some of the strategies that our clients have certainly used to build business cases. The first is our legal obligations in, re in relation to this space. And I know some of the organisations that you're from, uh, we do a lot of work in, in law firms and professional services, such as banking and finance and insurance and consulting um, and, and, and law firms in particular where uh, the, the le legislative requirements speak quite loudly to those occupations. Um, so any occupations that are very risk adverse, um, the legal ramifications you know, can be quite significant, um, particularly also in occupations where people are operating heavy machinery or equipment or um, driving um, trucks and vehicles and lifting and those sorts of things. So I'm going to reflect on, on the legal obligations on the end, at the end of the presentation just to, to inform people about what they are. But certainly there is a legislative requirement now. And I know a lot of you are from different um, states in Australia and harmonisation did try to be implemented a few years ago so that all states were operating off the same work, and health, work health and safety legislation. And I know some states are on board with it and some are not. Um, but I just think it's a good best practice guidelines basically to say we do have a legal obligation and in some ro roles where psychosocial risk factors are very high, I always think we can't afford not to from a compliance based perspective and a legal perspective. And we, we notice certainly a huge influx in organisations wanting to do something about mental health in the workplace when the legal, when the legislative requirements came out in 2012. It was a big impetus for a lot of organisations to say we need to be compliant with legislation, particularly in roles where we have people exposed to you know, high demand roles like call centres or emotionally distressing information or people who may be exposed to vicarious trauma. Um, we need to be putting some things in place from a legal perspective, from a risk mitigation strategy. So that's certainly one element that people use to build a business case and that we can't afford not to. We need to protect our businesses. The second factor is financial. And as I said before, that now that there's actually some good data out there, um, some benchmarking data undertaken primarily in that report by PwC a couple of years ago, which actually can now give us some good financial data and some good um, economics around mental health and well-being in the workplace and how that um, having good well-being is a massive driver of productivity and performance and we know that one of the biggest predictors of positivity of productivity and performance is employee engagement and one of the biggest predictors of employee engagement is well-being so it does have financial benefit I have also known other organisations and clients of ours who have gathered their own financial data to make a business case. So some organisations, um, I can think of a couple where they've actually, a couple of our, our law firm clients, for example, have actually gathered data from their workers' compensation claims, from their salary continuance claims in, in, um, in assisting somebody in, in, in benefits if they make a life insurance claim and also just some general information around length of time that people have been off work and absenteeism, impact on product productivity and performance. And one of our, our law firm clients um, was really struggling to make a business case to be able to do some mental health intervention in her organisation. And what she ended up doing was actually, it was a law firm and she actually ended up um, getting some lost time data and found that the average amount of time off work for a lawyer when they were struggling with a mental health issue was around three to four weeks. And she multiplied their hourly charge out rate of a senior lawyer by um, the days that they were absent. And it ended up to be a huge amount of money 
that, um, that the business was impacted by and actually talking in terms of the economic costs actually spoke volumes to the, um, to the board that she was presenting at. And so as a result, she did get some mental health intervention across the line. And now I'd say that they're one of the leading law firms um, that are doing some great work in this space, but they started off small um, just by making that business case. Uh, the other obligation is the care factor in terms of that we have a moral obligation to be able to, to protect the health and wellbeing of our employees. And sometimes this now with, with employers or employees having so much choice around things is that um, people will, it becomes an employer of choice uh, where, you know, if I feel as if my mental health is not supported, I feel as if where there's not good um, processes or building blocks in place for promoting wellbeing in the workplace, I might go and work for another competitor where that's valued. So I certainly see that um, the care factor and being an employer of choice is attractive um, to employees who are looking also to select who they're going to work for. And also because it's just the right thing to do. Um, and I know a couple of people that have gone to various boards and said, you know what, we want to do this because it is the right thing to do. Um, you know, we do want to, you know, really look after people's wellbeing along the way. Sure, there's, there's legal reasons why. Sure, there's financial reasons why an employer of choice, choice and business reasons why, but actually when we come down to it, it is absolutely the, the right thing to do in this space. Uh, so they're just some, some guidelines as to how you may make a business case for mental health in your, in your organisations. Um, I'd just like to introduce you to the wellbeing continuum here. And this is where I think the true integration, having a truly integrated approach for mental health is um, becoming now what organisations are looking for. So it's not just doing awareness raising um, once a year on Are You OK Day by holding a little seminar or a, or a, or a, or a morning tea, which is wonderful. That still go, speaks volumes, but it is around how do we integrate something like this in our workplace. So a lot of organisations are now turning their attention to what are the things that we can do to sustain wellbeing in our workplaces? So that's really looking at that prevention side. How do we build resilience? How do we operate in terms of mitigating risk along some of the psychosocial risk factors that some of our employees may be experiencing? So I'm going to come back to this a little later in the presentation when we talk about the building blocks. How do we build a mentally healthy workplace? So that's all around how do we keep people well at work? And what are the things that we can do within our organisations and within our culture to actually um, keep people well at work on the prevention side. The second element of having an integrated approach is what do we do when somebody starts to not travel so well? So how aware are our employees, are our managers, are our HR and wellbeing professionals within our organisation of what those early warning signs are, how to hold good conversations with people, what might be an early intervention, a methodology or framework that we implement within our organisations to help people if they become a little unwell. So that's the second stage. And then the third stage is really putting in good programs, return to work processes, rehabilitation support, um, treatment interventions on if somebody has become quite unwell and they're more at the recovery end and we're looking to assist them back into the workplace um, or to keep them at work, what are the things that we can do? So in summary, they'll be summarised in the building block section when I come to that later in the presentation, but just a couple of key highlights for the moment. Firstly, there's lots of studies that have looked at what are the biggest predictors of psychological wellbeing in the workplace. And time and time again, these studies will measure lots of various factors of, of workplace functioning. So they say, is it that, um, or what, what keeps people well at work? Is it variety? Is it feedback? Is it having a job that plays to your strengths? Having a job that you like? Is it um, having a great team around you? What are the things that actually contribute to keeping people well at work? And time and time again, they measure about 10 key factors of well-being in the workplace. And time and time again, they find two massive predictors of psychological well-being in the workplace. And they are both linked with support about psychological support in the workplace. So the first one, actually, I'm sure that you can, you can guess what that may be, is, has been shown to be the biggest predictor of psychological well-being is the quality of relationship between an employee and their immediate line manager. So um, the research shows that 
of an employee's wellbeing is predicted by the quality of that relationship with, with one's direct line manager. So they've gone away and done some more research and they found out what type of management style is actually the biggest predictor of psychological well-being in the workplace. And they found it's called supportive leadership or supportive management. So um, those with the supportive manager, even if they're in a role that's high workload, high volume, high job demands, if people feel as if they've got a supportive leader and supportive manager around them that they are reporting directly into, that becomes a psychological safety net it actually keeps people well at work, even in high demand type of roles. Uh, but the minute something changes in the quality of that relationship with that employee and that line manager, suddenly a work related challenge comes my way, or maybe a personal challenge comes my way, or maybe a combination of a couple of things, I am much more at risk of moving and shifting along that wellbeing continuum if I don't have in the absence of that supportive leadership. So supportive leadership is a buffer it is a protective factor and tends to keep people well at work. Uh, now, there's not nothing you know too hard necessarily about having some really good leadership skills and some good management skills. But in our experience over the last five to seven years, we have seen a major shift in this space where we have become so time poor. Organisations have become so time poor that people are shifting and that they have become more task focused in their leadership style. So someone comes to work on a Monday morning and people don't even say, good morning, how was your weekend? What did you get up to? Oh, you ran the marathon on the weekend. That's right. How did that go? Or you've been for this big holiday. What was that like? How was it? Um, you know, when people are not actually making all those little emotional deposits in the emotional bank account that actually make a big difference and will keep people well at work. So, um, so there's nothing necessarily hard about forming good relationships with our staff but it takes a time commitment. And when people are time poor, we've seen a shift to people being much more task focused. So leadership style, supportive leadership is well worth the investment if anybody is looking at what would be a good um, investment in terms of making a start or continuing the mental health journey. I always say having your leaders or your managers invested in um, mental health intervention uh, and leadership, some leadership skills. It doesn't have to be a big investment, but just being aware of their behaviour can make a tremendous difference in keeping people well at work. And um, the second big predictive factor of wellbeing in the workplace was actually the quality of our relationships within our team, so our collegial environment. So that didn't pre pre predict as much as 60%, but it certainly predicted... Um, certainly predicted quite a chunk of well-being was predicted by the quality of our relationships with our immediate team. So not only does those relationships actually serve to be good protective factors, keep people well at work, but also if people do go on to, predict, to, to experience a mental health issue, the quality of one's relationship with one's line manager and the quality of one's relationship with one team are massive predictors of recovery from the workplace. So it's certainly well worth the investment. Now, when I'm always looking at how do we build leadership capability in this space, I think it's about keeping it simple. You know, organisations don't necessarily have to invest in, you know, 360 degree retreats and taking people off site for a week. I mean, that's wonderful if organisations do that. But I just think that there's some simple things that we can do. And I like the language around the, the concept of micro inequities and micro affirmations. So micro inequities are actually the, just the little things. They're the little things that we may do unintentionally, the little things that we may do frequently, and sometimes are unrecognisable, actually, by the person, by the manager or by the colleague even. And they're so small that they often just go unnoticed. But over time, these micro inequities can build up. And these are the things that actually tend to erode um, good psychological well-being over time. So there's some examples of some micro inequities. And they can be, you know, they can be little things um, in terms of just um, not remembering somebody's name or um, having, taking people out for coffee meetings and always taking the same people out. It could be um, treating people a little differently um, in relation to aspects of, of, their, of their work and their job. Um, so they're, they're tiny little things. It can be even as simple as when, when somebody's talking to you, 
you're actually on the phone or you're reading your text messages at the same time or you're in a meeting and you're distracted and you're on your on your laptop and you're responding to text messages and, and things like that. So the micro inequities, they're small things, but over time they have been found to reduce well-being and to reduce re resilience um, in our you know in our staff. So the best way to um, to cope with micro inequities is actually to um, invest in the opposite, which is all around micro affirmations. Around oh, there's some examples of some of the micro inequities there. Just around some of those things that, that I said before around you know checking emails or texting during a face-to-face -face conversation um, consistently, not knowing or mispronouncing someone's name. It could be taking the same person out for coffee meetings or lunches. Um, uh, it could be interrupting a person mid-sentence, treating males or females quite differently. That can be that can be common in terms of eye contact or shaking hands differently with males and females. Allowing you know staff to speak equitably at staff meetings, um, you know thanking pe some people and not others for good work. Sending emails after work hours is actually a really common micro inequity, where it sets up the expectation that um, I'm, I might be emailing you because it's convenient for me to do some emails at 11 o'clock at night, but sometimes the message that might be is I'm expecting you actually to respond to that at, at that time. And I've certainly worked with some clients that have actually um, gotten up out of bed and actually <laughs> responded to people's emails at those times. So it's just being aware. And I use this concept a lot when I'm doing leadership training on wellbeing and mental health is just being aware as a manager or a colleague of your own micro inequities and the impact that that may have on staff wellbeing over time. They're so small, people are generally just operating out of habit in that space. As I mentioned before, the best way to um, counteract a micro inequity is actually to um, get good at expressing micro affirmations. And I like the concept of it's around Every day, what can I do? What little tiny things that I can do? They're subtle and they're small, but the little things that I can do that might build that emotional bank account on a daily basis. So they're so small, but they make a significant difference over time. So they can be little things around, you know, checking in, how, how was your weekend? Um, that's right, was your son's soccer grand final on the weekend? How did that go? Remembering something personal about someone goes a long way. Um, actively listening. When somebody is actually talking to you, you're actually mindful, you're actually present and you're listening. You're not distracted by your emails or your or SMSing. Um, you're giving credit to all those involved in a job. You might be giving feedback that's clear and consistent. Um, and, and the research on building resilience through feedback shows that it's not just about giving pe people feedback, oh, I thank you for, for that job, that was really great. It's about pointing out the strength that that colleague or that staff member used. So I like the way that you met, met that deadline and you worked really well under pressure with that customer and worked out some creative solutions. That's how we build um, resilience through, through affirmation with our staff. Um, remembering something personal, expressing praise and gratitude, using a person's name, greeting your team in the morning. I was going into an organisation recently and I had HR running in behind me and I was presenting to some of their executives and they said, can you just remind these, these executives to say good morning to their staff when they arrive at work and goodbye to their staff when they leave. So as you can see, the level of micro affirmation in that organisation was very low. So I'm always just saying to managers, it's just about the little tiny things that you do on a daily basis that will actually you know, put those emotional deposits into the emotional bank account. Because what we see is that if those emotional deposits in the emotional bank account are very, very high, it is the one factor that has been shown to reverse the trend of the majority of people not coming forward for any assistance or support if they're struggling with a mental health issue. So it's the one factor that makes somebody, if I feel as if I've got trust there, I've got rapport there, I've got a good relationship with my manager or my colleague, I'm more likely to disclose I'm not traveling so well because it's done on the backdrop of support and trust. However, if that emotional bank account is completely empty, there is no way someone is going to come forward to disclose something that's so vulnerable to them. So um, little things, it's just the little things that we might do that build, that build well-being and the little things we may do out of habit that actually may decrease well-being over time. So this leads on then to, you know, what are the, the types of things that we can do to build our mentally healthy workplaces? So 
I'm just going to, some of you may have heard of this research and this was done by um, Guarding Minds at Work, which is a Canadian, uh, Canadian research actually. And they have come up with 13 psychosocial risk factors. If you wanted to search this up, there's a lot more information out there on if we want to build a mentally healthy workplace and, and we have an organisation that's high on these 13 risk factors, that's great. We're going to be heading in the right direction to be building our good capability for, for well-being within our teams. Uh, but if we do a little audit on our organisation and we might find that we're actually low on a few of these, that would indicate that there's a good place to start. So I certainly know organisations that have actually designed some surveys, some well-being surveys around these 13 psychosocial risk factors, which have been found to actually um, strengthen and build uh, mentally healthy workplaces and, and teams. Some of you, if you're from a law firm environment, you may also be aware that there's a, a foundation, the Tristan uh, Jepsum Memorial Foundation, actually took, a few years ago, they took these 13 psychosocial risk factors when this first Canadian research came out, and it was quite groundbreaking around, this now gives us some ideas about how we might build a mentally healthy workplace. And they actually developed an action plan for all of those psychosocial risk factors. So for example, how do we create an organisational culture that is high on psychological support? Or how do we work on having good civility and respect within our organisations? And the Tristan Jepson Memorial Foundation actually worked with a whole team of people, a whole committee, and they developed basically action plans for all of these 13 psychosocial risk factors. So if anyone's interested to look at what that looks like, it is quite relevant to law firms, obviously, um, because it was done for all the legal profession. But I also think it's very relevant for organisations outside of the legal profession as well. And good idea just to see what those action plans and what those items actually look like. It's very practical. And you can just find that at the Tristan Jepson Memorial Foundation website. And they have all of those details up there. So I'm not going to elaborate on the 13 psychosocial risk factors because I've actually used them. I've embedded them in the building blocks. And I quite like this. Um, th these are the six building blocks that the evidence and the research shows us around that we need to be good at having, as I mentioned before, we need to be good at having a very integrated approach around mental health in the workplace. So you might notice there the top three building blocks, smarter work design, building better team culture and building resilience. They're all to do with prevention on the wellbeing continuum. They're all the elements of the building blocks that keep people well at work. How do we actually um, promote the positive of work and actually get good at at prevention, that's that's the, the first row. And then the second row is the early intervention, support recovery and increase awareness. So they're all the things around how do we how do we behave, what interventions and policies and procedures do we have in place? Should people start to shift on that continuum? Should they start to become a little unwell? So the first line is around intervention, sorry, about around prevention, and the second line is around getting good at intervention. So what I've attempted to do for this presentation is I've tried to make little action plans for all of those building blocks. In the literature, if you just searched um, mentally healthy workplace, this was undertaken only a couple of years ago, I think 2015 or 2014 that this research came out. So it's still very new. It's still probably what the latest, um, the latest research out there around how do we create mentally healthy workplaces undertaken by the Mentally Healthy Workplace Alliance. So you can certainly search that up and you'll find a little bit more, more detail there around the research. But for example, if, if we know that the evidence points to these are the six key factors that actually promote uh, wellbeing, these are some things that we can do. So for the first one around smarter work design, um, it's certainly around getting good at, I think one of the biggest factors in this space is getting good at um, workload management. And I certainly work with a lot of professional services organisation where workloads and work demands are very high. Everyone's going through organisational change. Everyone's doing more with less. So it's around, you know, and these are the practical things I've tried to embed in here. How, how are our managers or how are our staff? Do they have regular workload meetings? Are we delegating work in teams equitably and fairly? Or do I have people who are really good at the jobs or overloaded and people who are not so good um, underutilised? Um, do I know what my staff's workload are? Am I aware that we might have staff that are working back till 
till midnight and other staff are leaving work at three or four, you know, am I aware of how much work is actually going on and who's carrying, you know, what people's individual workloads are like? And if I am aware of that, really getting good at embedding wellbeing conversations into our daily, into our regular workloading planning kind of meetings. I mean, I work with a lot of managers that'll say, you know, what have you got on this week? And what deadlines do you have? And, and what are our key milestones? What are the things we have to do this week? It's very task focused. But I'm always saying to people around, add that, add on to that, the wellbeing conversation around you. You've been noticing you've been working really hard. You've been working really well, but how are you? How are you traveling? How are you going? Um, am I, as a manager, meeting our client expectations appropriately? Am I managing those? Um, when deadlines are set, are they appropriate? Are they realistic? How am I, how am I being a buffer with that supportive management style? Um, do staff actually have the resources to do their job effectively? Am I giving clear guidelines and priorities on what I expect from staff and when? Um, a big one in this space is flexibility. As we know, flexibility is a big predictor of employee wellbeing, but that's going to be different for every single staff member. So do I know my, my individual team members' um, needs for flexibility? For one person, that might be they've got to drop the kids off at, at, at work and they're not able to make um, 8.30 meetings or 8 a.m. meetings. You know, we need to make our meetings a little later to encompass people. Or maybe it's some people like to do a day, for, day of work from from home once every once a week or somebody might need to finish work at four o'clock once a week to go and coach their son's soccer team, whatever that might be, but just having those individual needs and understanding what that is, ensuring that staff are leaving at a reasonable time and really being aware of that. I see a lot of the time when people are very unwell at work, one of the biggest things that they do is mask it and hide it and they work really long hours to overcompensate, to show people that, you know, I, I can do this, there's nothing wrong and I'm, you know, and I'm coping and I'm managing really well and absolutely checking in on staff that are working long hours and getting good at doing that, getting good at having those wellbeing conversations early um, is really important to catch, catch people if they might be struggling. So there's some just practical things that leaders can do. And the second building block is around then, how do we get good at building better team cultures? I mean, they're just simple things. As I said, saying good morning to people when they're walking in and saying goodbye when they leave, actively listening without distraction, which is quite hard these days when people are busy and they're multitasking, focusing on staff when talking to them, try and see things from another's perspective, you know, using empathy. Empathy is a huge predictor of, of um, supportive leadership. Um, spending time talking to staff where possible, rather than relying on email, it might be more efficient to give somebody some performance feedback via email or SMS, which I've seen, seen done, but is it actually effective? So I think sometimes we've got to think it might be efficient, but actually is it effective? So getting good at making those emotional deposits into the emotional bank account, allowing people time for connectedness and engagement. It might be um, a team meeting once a week. It might be having a morning tea for somebody's birthday. These are the such simple things um, for team connectedness. And as we know, the quality of our work of our workplace relationships is so important in keeping people well at work. But it's the one thing that we see these days is most at risk of going. We don't have time to do that. We don't have time for a for a weekly meeting. And if you are having a weekly meeting. Um, it's about how can I use that in a way to promote people's strengths, to celebrate achievements as well. Um, getting to know people's interests and their, and their goals and their motivators for their job. Having regular catch up and reviews with people. Um, getting people involved in the planning of their work, giving them some autonomy. We know that that's autonomy and control is really important. Um, celebrating and acknowledging achievements. In some cultures that I work in, um, people are very good at giving feedback when things are not so, haven't gone so well, but actually taking the time. We know the biggest way to build, build resilience is actually acknowledging people's achievements and the strength that they use to actually, to meet those achievements. Um, giving feedback, praise and gratitude, you know, recognising people, rewarding people, even if it's just done verbally, but just um, acknowledging people's efforts goes a huge way to keep keeping people well at work. And just a, a, a short story that I had a client recently who had worked really, really hard on this particular deadline, felt really um, engaged in the process, had worked some long hours, met this client deadline, did a very good job in actually um, achieving the task. And the next, I think she'd finished work like at around 1am the night that it was due, had done a, done a great job. 
and um, the next day kind of got into work and um, and her manager just basically said, okay, so here's the next piece of work. So didn't even acknowledge or recognise the effort and the reward that it, that had actually gone into that work. And actually, she then went off work for a couple of weeks experiencing really low mood and anxiety. And I thought the the buffer, the supportive leadership, it just got if that had just got in there during that job and immediately after the job, she would have actually been fine. But it's just the the impact of those things I think we can never underestimate. And um, the third building block is how do we actually build resilience? So thanking people and recognizing their work in challenging times. Um, planning, I think that's a big thing for a manager to sit down and say, okay, we've got this really busy time coming ahead for us in the next couple of weeks. So we're going through a massive change. I'm gonna help you plan and, and, and prepare for that. So we know it's coming, it's not about avoiding it, but how are we all going to um, work together so we can meet those challenges, we can meet that workload or meet those deadlines. For a manager to role model, keeping things in perspective, you know, if someone makes a little simple error or spelling mistake on an email, am I really, is it really the end of the world? Um, so really keeping those challenges in perspective. Building in recovery time, I mean, I see that a lot is that people are working huge hours these days, but not necessarily having any recovery time. So maybe if somebody has finished a job at, uh, at 2 a.m., Maybe that maybe it'd be great if they could come into work around 10 or 11 the next day. You know, just having that recovery time and giving people permission, making it okay for that to actually happen in our teams and for that to happen in our cultures. Um, you know, really emailing staff, you know, watching my behavior around emailing staff during appropriate work hours. If I'm going to be emailing people um, or I'm going to be working outside of those hours, uh, because it suits me, that's great, but um, not having the expectation that, that all staff will be up all hours, you know, responding to that. Certainly delivering feedback in a constructive way. Um, you know, keeping a sense of humour as well, I think is really important around, you know, having a laugh and having a little bit of fun, um, having conversations with people about their hours and, you know, making staff aware of access to, to psychological and, and that social support as well in terms of getting good at building that resilience and, and doing that together. And the biggest thing I think in that space is actually role model, modeling resilience as well and behavior in accordance with that. Um, the fourth building block, so they're all the ones that are really looking at prevention. So that's around keeping people well at work. And even if in your organizations, you're working on just a couple of those things, you'll be doing a wonderful job in really making a big difference. The next building blocks are around that early intervention piece. It's around, you know, the, the beauty of spending time getting to know people a little bit at work and a little bit outside of work, having catch-ups, reviews, having staff wellbeing on the radar. I think one of the biggest things is around getting leaders and managers to actually have conversations with people about their wellbeing when they're well, just to set that up as a, this is something that we do in our culture. Sure, I can check in about your work and your workload planning, but around how are you and how are you traveling, just getting good at initiating those conversations and practicing those conversations when people are well, getting to know your staff's stress responses, what, you know, when they're not traveling so well, getting to know what their pressure points are, um, you know, having work that might play to their strengths, um, having good employee assistance support and provide, you know, having a good provider at the ready. And I think also being able to promote your EAP in a way that might um, encourage people. Uh, I think I've seen in the last few years that employee assistance programs sometimes have suffered from a branding problem or an identity problem in terms of um, it being used as a, as a last resort. You know, I use the EAP if I'm really unwell or if things have really got to a pressure point or if I'm really in trouble at work. But it's around rebranding that in terms of the EAP is really about wellbeing and actually helps people you know, to keep people well at work. You can use it for coaching, you can use it for mindfulness, you can use it for a whole range of resilient strategies. So I think there's some organisations, certainly we've rebranded our EAP services that we offer more in line with wellbeing to get people to um, feel more, more uh, readily able to link in at early intervention when they need to. The next building block in the intervention space after early intervention then is getting good at um, supporting recovery. You know, do I know, am I educated around if I've got someone in my team that is struggling with a mental health issue, do I know a bit about depression, what that looks like and how it impacts on them? Do I know about how I might need to make some reasonable accommodations and short-term solutions? Um, am I having regular check-ins with people? Are we actually having, you know, training or awareness sessions? Am I using return to work programs in a proactive way? Um, am I using days like national days, like Are You OK Day or Mental Health Month, just to, as another opportunity to reduce stigma? One of the best ways to reduce stigma is actually certainly to, to talk about it and to, to break the silence that it feeds off. So making it 
you know, kind of more and more a part of our organisational and team culture uh, so that we can get better at supporting recovery and early intervention methodologies as well in there. And the last building block, the building a mentally healthy workplace is around just increasing that awareness. So the more that we talk about mental health uh, on the positive side, how do we keep people well, but also when people are not traveling so well, um, challenging our own assumptions about mental health, um, having conversations that it makes that builds that psychological safety culture so that people can feel feel comfortable. And I always think it's around, you know, even from today, what do you take back to your organizations? How does that change the way that you communicate to people or the way that you might share this information and share resources to your team and to, and to your colleagues? And, and embedding that. And I'm very optimistic that if we can get better at embedding mental health and wellbeing in our everyday conversations and participating in national days and making it more normal, um, that one day we will be talking about mental health in the same breath that we would talk about a physical health issue. So there, that's just some a summary of the building blocks and what the latest research is around that. And I've just, if you look at the research, it's quite empirical and quite evidence-based. Um, what I've tried to do in that little presentation is make it very practical about these are the types of management behaviours that would be consistent with that. Also, just finally, just as a reminder about the legislation that we're all um, operating in accordance with. And I know some states are, are using this legislation and some states are not. But I just think it's best practice anyway um, to, to encompass mental health in the workplace. Obviously, it's around when this legislation came out, it was quite controversial because it means that mental health, the causation of someone's mental health issue is actually irrelevant these days. If someone is coming to work and they are unwell because of a, of a work-related issue, it's the, work, it's the employer's responsibility to manage and support that person at work. If someone's coming to well up is coming to work and they're not traveling so well because of a, um, a pre-existing mental health issue. It's, a, it's the employer's responsibility to manage and support that person at work. And if someone's coming to work because and they're unwell because of a personal issue, it is the employer's responsibility to manage and support that person at work. So causation now is irrelevant. I used to go into organizations a few years ago where someone would say to me, oh, Joe Bloggs isn't traveling so well, but that's because of a personal issue. So we don't need to talk about it. We don't need to have it on our radar. We don't need to support him. When actually now under this legislation, we could be negligent under this act. So certainly getting good at identifying the risk is very important. So whenever a risk is flagged to us, can come in one of those three ways there, we are immediately under a legal obligation to assess the risk. And that's quite you know fancy language for go and have a conversation with that person around what's going on. And we usually encourage line managers to be supported by HR to actually, if they're skilled enough and have a good relationship with the person, to be able to have those conversations around um, what's going on, what's the cause of that person's distress, and then putting in a bit of a plan as to how we might be able to assist. But now when this legislation came out, if there are any concerns after that initial low level conversation, organisations are very much within their remit now to be able to undertake a formal assessment of somebody's wellbeing. And we certainly do a lot of those for organisations under this legislation, where sometimes if you have an employee there and you're really concerned about them, but if you're not actually taking action on them, uh, or to support and assist them, then um, one could be failing to comply with this act. So we do lots of assessments, wellbeing assessments, fitness for work assessments, independent assessments or well checks where people are concerned about someone's wellbeing and the organisation needs to know what is their condition, how is it impacting on work and what can we do as an organisation to support and assist them. So, uh, so reviewing the risk is, is the third step, which is also around if this person is struggling with a mental health issue, do we have anybody else? That might also be struggling do we have should we we need to be aware if there's anybody else in the team or anybody else that also may be struggling and any plans or interventions we may need to put in place more holistically and finally the legislation guides us into actually putting a plan in place we need to do something to manage the situation to put some, some controls and some measures in place to support this person in their recovery if it's a low level situation, organisations can do that themselves. A very simple plan would be making a referral into the employee assistance program if somebody is struggling with a personal issue. That would be a very simple plan. A more complex plan is you might have somebody in the organisation with more of a complex mental health condition where you need an external assessment to 
help to guide the plan. What is What do I need to put in place and how can I actually do that? Um, what is a recovery plan that we can put in place and how can the workplace support that? So that's in line with the legislation. There's a bit more to that, but that's kind of a simple rundown on what the legislation is. And I probably see the gap. The, the big gap that I see in our organisations at the moment is people might be very good at doing the awareness raising activities. They might be very good at complying with legislation. We've got an EAP, we, um, we're doing some mental health awareness training, all those sorts of things. But I just think one of the biggest things organisations can do to make a difference in this space is actually to develop a good robust mental health intervention framework. So when mental health issues are flagged to a manager or flagged to HR, what is the process that we follow for low, medium and high risk situations? And whenever we do mental health training for organisations, we make sure that we are developing a robust mental health intervention for the organisation and in conjunction with them to be able to feed into policies and procedures because you can do all the mental health training in the world, all the Are You OK Days, all the great speakers in for mental health awareness training or mental health month, but if we don't have, if organisations don't have a robust mental health intervention framework that suits the organisation, that all relevant stakeholders are trained in and are, are aware on, then we don't actually make a big difference in our organisations. And I can think of one particular, we've worked with many organisations in this space about developing their frameworks, but one organisation that we worked with uh, last year just put some uh, metrics around this. And they were able to demonstrate, it was a law firm, and they had a, were able to demonstrate that they were able to save over a million dollars in salary continuance cost, lost time due to mental health issues, absenteeism and presenteeism and performance issues as a result of adopting the mental health intervention framework. Um, so it's a, it's, I'd see that's the gap and the next thing for organisations to be good at doing. So um, I hope today's session was useful for you in, in having some little practical takeaways. Um, and I just think one of the, the biggest things around this is considering what's the action that you're going to take out of a result of today, what are the things you can take back to the business, and just at the end of the presentation, I've just popped in there a couple of useful resources. There's a brand new paper just published in a couple of months ago, 2017, by the University of Tasmania, which actually outlines um, the integrated approach I was talking about, and they've also acknowledged that, that is, that's missing, but what they've actually done is tried to fill the gap and actually gives us some really good best practice guidance guidelines now on what organisations can do to practically build a mentally healthy workplace. And I've just popped in there um, the research on the 13 psychosocial risk factors from Guarding Minds at Work as well, if anyone's interested to do some further reading in this space. Thank you. So thank you so much, Rachel, so much gold in what you've just presented to us today, not only in demonstrating that business case, and I think most critically also the cost of doing nothing, but also some real practical takeaways on things that we can all adopt, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis to really nurture and support the uh, mental well-being of our peers. So thank you, thank you very much. And now I'd like to open it to questions, and we have had a question come through from William from North America and William has asked why do you think the ROI for addressing mental health in the workplace is so much better than the ROI for physiological health which is generally non-existent so great question there from William of which Rachel I'll ask you now to respond uh, I think that in terms of the I, I think firstly that Mental health is so prevalent. I mean, certainly what we're seeing in Australia, if we're looking at that one in three employees in our in most many Australian businesses will experience a mental health issue at some point in their career. And and you know, we're working in industries where we're getting calls every every single day from people who are struggling with medium to high risk mental health situations. So I think in terms of there's there's good things that we can do. And, and not necessarily at a massive cost that actually can make a wonderful positive difference to people's uh, to building a mentally healthy workplace and and as we said you know I think the biggest things are being able to put in a really robust mental health intervention framework that embeds into policy and procedure doing some work around leadership and, and leadership capability and leading well-being in our workplace so I think that actually from doing because mental health has such enormous flow-on effects 
um, that impact businesses significantly and impact employees significantly when someone's not traveling so well, I think we can get some really good return on investment just by you know, not doing necessarily, we don't have to go to a huge amount of effort to, to get those returns. Um, and the Price Waterhouse Coopers article uh, and paper, which I'm happy to send anybody, is actually really interesting. It certainly goes through that return on investment for um, mental health issues and, and, and simple things. Having an employee assistance program speaks volumes to people's engagement in the workplace. You know, it's a simple thing. It can be a small invest, in, investment as well. Um, having your leaders trained up in, you know, having wellbeing conversations on a daily basis. So I think there's some simple things that we can do, which actually go a long way to actually having a really good return on investment. And Rachel, we have another question through from William. It's just, the question was on the back of your EAP rebranding, whether you have seen a change in EAP utilisation as a result of that. Yes, so we have worked with um, some, we work a lot with law firms. And as you can imagine, um, law firms can be quite sceptical <laughs> about employee assistance programs. So we have really been working with our clients on rebranding it in terms of like, so one of our clients calls it a wellbeing, their wellbeing program and others have called it catchy names that mean something to that organisation. So it might be an acronym that means something to their organisation. So it's not even called an employee assistance program. And we just did one client's, it was a law firm's um, uh, quarterly report and we'd recently taken on this new client only this year. And what we noticed from rebranding, firstly, was that more partners than ever before were using the Employee Assistance Program. Historically, no partners had actually ever used the EAP. So that was a massive thing. And secondly, for the first time in that organisation's history, more lawyers were accessing, accessing the service and support staff. So we didn't have the Employee Assistance con Contract previously to be able to compare it, but that's what their results were, were from before. So I certainly think rebranding it has resulted in people feeling more comfortable to use it and also just using it in a proactive way to keep themselves well at work. So a heartfelt thank you to Rachel for sharing her wisdom today on how to create a mentally healthy workplace. And looking now to our next webinar, which is scheduled for the 5th of September on wellness on a budget, how to create programs that both your employees and finance manager will love. So hope you can join us for that next session. Just a reminder too that we'd love your feedback on how you have found today's session. We encourage you to fill in the evaluation form when it comes through to your inbox and also what other topics you would like to see into the future as well. Also for those that are looking to further build the knowledge capacity of their internal stakeholders, you know, we'd love to direct you to our Wellness Wise Academy website, which further highlights the programs we have available, targeting leaders within your organisation, targeting those, the practitioner or coordinator who are responsible for managing employee health and wellness, and also those site or department based champions, and look at how collectively you can really build a wellness culture within your workplace. So again, thank you for your time and input into today's session and we hope you can join us for our next Wellness Wise webinar. Thank you.